When all that's left to do is reflect on what's been done. This is where sadness breeds the sadness of everyone. But that's fucking boring. So who's ready to absolutely shit all over a man's legacy? I know I am. And don't you worry, my sexy little chads and chadettes. This time, we have a happy ending. American McGee's Alice was a massive success, both critically and commercially. So successful, in fact, that it quickly garnered interest in a movie adaptation, a sequel, and even quickly launched McGee into his next project, Oz. It wouldn't be long, however, before the movie entered development hell, became vaporware celluloid, Oz was cancelled, the sequel was cancelled, Rogue Entertainment was shut down, McGee would leave EA, tie his name to a game he had literally nothing to do with, <sighs> become the first celebrity to make good on their word of leaving the country if they didn't like the election results, shit out Bad Day LA, work with GameTap on Grimm, and found Spicy Horse. But all this time, that never-ending drive to make the sequel stayed with him. McGee once stated that he always envisioned Alice as a trilogy, so a sequel was somewhat inevitable and would always be a question of when, not if. It wouldn't be too terribly long when a slightly less old necro in his short pants would receive word of a sequel being in development in 2009. Made for what American would later claim was $2 million, a respectable amount for a mid-tier title at the time, the game would receive three trailers overall, with only really one of them giving any realistic image of what the game would actually look like. And if you know anything about the time... Yeah, the EA effect had kicked into full gear, slamming development with woes, but in the full interest of fairness, I can't lay the blame entirely at EA's feet, as the art book that later came out would hint that maybe there were some issues with management of the studio, as well as some confusion in expectations set. But, through all of that, through EA's bullshit, a relatively new studio having some subpar management and a decade-long wait, on June 14th in the year of our darkest timeline 2011, Duke Nukem Forever would finally release. There's a Oh, and, uh, also, Alice Madness Returns would release, and I have not known a long-lasting, fulfilling happiness ever since. Make no mistake, I don't hate this game, I just hate 
every single fucking thing about it, and that was a lie <laughs> because I hate this game. The first game took so long to really get to for a myriad of reasons that mostly amounted to, well, I kind of already did it. I have simply lost all of that shit and had to go redo it. This video took so long because despite completing the game over 10 times over the past 10 years, I always dread having to play it and it's always worse than I remember. I promised you a happy ending this time, but this ain't no fairy tale. We are the things that were and shall be again. So it's not going to be very pretty getting there. Ten years Alice has spent at Rutledge Asylum, and she's finally well enough to make her way back into the world where she finds herself at a happy little orphanage run by her therapist, Dr. Angus Bumby. We're introduced to her situation with a cute little cardboard vignette of one of her therapy sessions going horribly wrong as he attempts to use hypnotherapy to make Alice simply forget her troubles. He ends the exercise, and we're grimly reminded that no matter how long it's been, no matter how much technology advances, Unreal Engine 3 will always be shit at loading in textures, and we're going to have to get used to it as that signature pop-in is prevalent throughout the entire game. That is to say, it's fucking constant! Game development engine dying even as it was shat out into the world aside, Alice is sent out on an errand where her most observant players will receive clever hints at the game's progression and even its plot. First things first, yeah, this time we don't get a snazzy case booklet to give us insight into the real world events of Alice's life and instead are asked to partially play them. The art direction is classic, it's the meat space of this game, and as always they took a stylized look that will far outlive any graphical prowess of ultra-realism, and yeah, I'm here for it. But nothing lasts too terribly long as good old girl finds herself following a kitty down an alleyway. Here, we're introduced to the fact that Alice isn't just suffering from bad memories, she's plagued by hallucinations and severe instability, so much so that it leaves the viewer wondering how the fuck she could have been diagnosed as being in any state that would warrant releasing her into the general public. She's quickly brought out of that when she's accosted by Pris, a severe alcoholic who were given another vignette explaining her relationship to Alice, and yeah, it's annoying, and she's nobody, and after another hallucination we'll continue to hear her voice, but won't see her again until damn near the end of the game, and yet another hallucination, and seriously, how the fuck did any doctor see this delusional bint as being anything close to being safe to put out into the world? I mean, yeah, it's Victorian England, and the prescription for a woman stubbing her toe was amputation and a laudanum enema. No! No! Not another enema! Yes, another and another! Until you come to your senses! But goddamn! And I don't really know what else to say at this point beyond, and this is where it all starts falling the fuck apart, and that's because this is where it all starts falling the fuck apart. Look, I'm not saying that American just played Bayonetta and decided, hmm, maybe I can make that too, because I don't know if he's played it. Hell, I don't even know if he's fucking heard of it. But I am going to spend a hell of a lot of time fucking implying it because the sure oversimplified similarities are a little too serendipitous for my tastes. Very loud, overly dramatic fake sigh. After American McGee's Alice's opening, Alice is dropped screaming into Wonderland, confused, scared, and entering a nightmare she has yet to even grasp the scope of. Madness Returns gives us a cutscene, a few hallucinations, and then a fucking anime power-up scene. Yes, the dress and looks and makeup and all that shit, it's not just her idealized self in her fantasy world, it's her Super Saiyan 3, her infinite climax, her infinite devil trigger, and if I catch any of you typing the lyrics to that shit battle theme in the comments, I will end you. Yes, before we've even gotten into the games proper, it's been made painfully obvious that Madness Returns isn't a horror game, and it's probably not going to be about anything. It's McGee's anime waifu hack and slasher, just minus the charm and passion that Kamiya puts into everything. Just as before, Alice is quickly greeted by the Cheshire Cat, whose voice is... Well, let's just say I wouldn't have gone this route. About time too, Alice. Perfect. When you're not on edge, you're taking up too much space. It's not a question of if, Alice, it's when. Now hold on, and as they say, shut up. She was completely deranged. You picked up her crown, but now you've put it down. You must speak to her. What's left of her anyway? Make no mistake, this is the man, the myth, the legend Roger Jackson. Yes, the original voice of the Cheshire Cat. But everything is... 
different. The biting cynic voice that he once had is now replaced by whatever the hell this is, and it will only get worse from here. Most of the cast of the original game reprise their roles, and at least in the case of Alice and the Hatter, are done incredibly well. But returning characters like the Cat and March Hare and White Rabbit who only appears in challenge rooms? Yeah, I don't like it, and it will only get worse as we go. Help, Alice! We need your help! Don't desert us! Again, don't ignore us! Why do you suffer? The Queen's tyranny is just a memory. She has no power over you, does she? Our enemies come and go, but now a new evil reigns, and this fiend's malevolence has eclipsed the conquered Queen's. You, um, you maybe want to try that one again? Oh shit, bruh! I'm like, been vivisected and my guts are hanging out and I'm dying and shit. Is this fucking Monty Python? Lengthy tutorials introducing the player to basic fucking mechanics and reintroducing dead characters and new weapons to the player later, and we're given a nice little visual of how Wonderland is being destroyed by turning everything orange. The madness infecting the realm and space vortexes of the original make a return, but rather than the nightmarish psychedelics, we instead get unhealthy piss orange. Drink more water, McGee. By the orange Fanta point, we've already been introduced to the most common type of enemies that we will be facing. The Ruin. They're great designs, I fucking promise. Running the gamut of inky black goo with furnaces and doll faces to inky black goo with furnaces and doll faces to massive hulks of inky black goo with furnaces and doll faces and all the way to inky black goo with doll faces, but the furnaces are replaced by having to wait. Yay! I, I really hope to fuck I'm not going to be constantly fighting them throughout the entire run, resulting in a game wearing out its welcome way before I've even finished the third chapter. But don't worry, each chapter has chapter-specific enemies. Very quickly, we're introduced to madcaps, miniature hatters, wielding dinnerware, weaponry, and... Yep, they've got a variation that makes you wait. Fuck me. Hey, look, a reference to the first game, and a pretty good one at that. We're going to get a lot of these from the cat, which would be great. Acknowledge the shit that came before. Yeah, let's do that. But they do it way the fuck wrong, and they just evolve into the Cheshire Cat just quoting himself from the first game, only with way worse voice acting. Only a few find the way. Some don't recognize it when they do. Some don't ever want to. Only a few find the way. Some don't recognize it when they do. Some don't ever want to. Confront what frightens or offends you. Reckless or insulting talk should never go unchallenged. Confront what frightens or offends you. Reckless or insulting talk should never go unchallenged. To the royal guards of this realm, we are all victims in waiting. To the royal guards of this realm, we are all victims in waiting. Only the foolish believe suffering is just wages for being different. Only the foolish believe suffering is just wages for being different. And there's more, a hell of a lot more in fact, including references to dialogue from the original game that went entirely unused and you can only find by digging through the game's files, but for the sake of the fact that this is already going to be long as shit. Anyway, we're gonna move on from here. But okay, maybe we're still not into our first chapter proper. Well, we get there and we're introduced to the It's Just Bayonetta Part 2. That's right, once each chapter proper begins, Alice is given a new dress themed around it. And at this point, I would normally be like, And it's just a boobinetta, and he's a suck! But I actually like it. I'm not too big of a fan of a few of the designs, but they help break up the monotony and add an extra level of charm. And not to mention, this kind of came out at the point where your character wearing the exact same suit for 12 hours straight was no longer a technical limitation and was an active choice. So in playing a chapter select, you can even equip different dresses that add different effects and alter aspects of the game, and that's good. That's really good. That's one thing I can put on the board as something that the game does well. They even put out DLC for extra dresses, which yes, I have a fucking favorite. Here it is, right there. That, that one, that one's my favorite. And even different weapon skins that have different effects as well. Hell yeah! No, we're not going to talk about the other DLC that takes up forever to boot since we have to go through the game's unskippable splash screens every fucking time and really should have been a standalone release. It's, it's just the first game remastered. They've changed some sound effects and upscaled the resolution in some shit, but certain environmental death scenes don't play and the call Cheshire Cat button doesn't fucking work. Great fucking remaster, bro. 
Yet another thing I can put up there is the art direction. Unreal Engine 3 and Fago Piss aside, American yet again proves why he is who he is, making one of the most visually imaginative and striking games to ever grace my fucking eyeballs. Every philosophy behind the first title's world design is mostly here. It's not all done well, as the contiguous world is too broken up and fragmented resulting in constant teleports, but for probably 80% of the game, it is undeniably a treat to look at. And then there's the sex stuff! And because everything good about this game has to be undone by the fact that it's just Bayonetta, we come to the train. There's a heinous train rampaging through Wonderland, and much like the original game's use of metaphor and allegory, this train represents the train Dr. Bumby is going to run on Alice because his sissy hypnotherapy is actually a front for turning children into sex slaves. That's right, Chadgus Bumbo knows that the future lies in sex robots, but is a firm subscriber to the idea that building them out of brass would probably not go down well. And he's a few decades away from silicone, so he goes with the next best thing. And that brings us to the problem outside of it just being Bayonetta, outside of it just being anime waifu hack and slash, a problem that is so fundamental, it should have been shit canned with the idea of a sequel being buried. How do you build a sequel to a game about mental illness, depression, PTSD, loss, grief, and having to move on? Easy. You fucking don't. But McGee makes it about rapists! You know, that thing you shouldn't do? Two simple rules, don't make your heroine's motivation having been raped, and don't put the hero's girlfriend in a fucking fridge! And let's add a third one, don't make a fucking game about mental illness about killing an outside force that is actively creating your fucking problems. How do you follow up a difficult, deep, and strong game about an inner struggle? by making it an external struggle against a cartoonishly evil villain. Of course! Fucking brilliance! Ah, oh, shower him in praise. I'm not even into gameplay yet, and I'm just listing off things that are wrong with the game. So let's just make it clear and hope we can move on. Everything Alice does right, Madness Returns doesn't just do wrong, it goes completely out of its way to do the entire opposite of. Late in the game, i.e. read the fucking end, Alice's mental image of Bumby recites a bit of poetry. For the most part, it seems to come out of left field, but in fact, if you go looking at the start, you can actually find one of the orphans reciting it. The train is coming with a chimey cars, with comfy seats, wheels of stars. So hush, my little ones, have no fear. The man in the moon is the engineer. Let me make this as painfully clear as I possibly can. The first time you gain control of Alice, when you're dealing with the uncomfed herb all to control and shit e to navigate real world, you are already having to go out of your way to hunt for secrets to get the plot of the game. And it's not just secrets and allusions to what is coming, the actual story is hidden from the player. At least, parts that make it make sense are. It's not enough that the game completely goes the opposite route of the original, but now instead of having a casebook that you can read in order to gain more insight into an already self-contained story, this time you have to go way the fuck out of your way to collect memories for Alice, which then help tell the story. To be 100% totally fair, McGee actually wanted to do this in the original game, and staying on that fairness track, it's a really fucking good thing he couldn't. The result is twofold. On the one hand, the player who goes looking collects the memories with Alice, listens to them, and pieces the facts together along with her. You learn what's going on as she does, and you get there as she does. On the other hand, if you don't find them, or halfway through have grown tired of slogging through keyholes just to get a fucking worthless collectathon bullshit piece, you will have massive gaps in uncovering the story. Alice will then come to all these conclusions and begin hurling accusations at people with no real context for the player. My first time playing, I had no fucking clue what was going on or how Alice uncovered Bimble's nefarious deeds. I missed the girl at the start. I missed context-sensitive memories, and it took me three playthroughs to figure out at which points she drew her conclusions. It's not just a shitty story of a sex trafficker, it's not just a shitty anime waifu defeats the villain story, it's not just told in the most painstaking and anti-viewer manner possible, it does the absolute worst, most reprehensible thing of all things. It wastes the player's time to gain anything from it. Look, I've played through this game some 10 plus goddamn times. 
I still have not collected every memory. To this day, there are still gaps in Alice's logic, her story, and how she and the player are supposed to uncover it for me. I want you to imagine scouring a segment, spending five minutes going out of your way to find a keyhole, slowly slog through it just to get a poorly normalized audio clip that permanently damages your ears, all to learn that Pris is a raging alcoholic for the fifth fucking time. Now stretch that over the course of 10 and a half to 12 hours and tie understanding the game's own story to that. It's not just a bad story, it's not just a bad story sequel, it's not just poorly told, it actively goes out of its way to waste the player's time. Took me a fucking long time to understand exactly what is wrong with this game. It actually took multiple playthroughs. There is so much fucking wrong but I couldn't narrow it down to what exactly the problem is. Sure, that's crazy. It's not just one problem. It never fucking is. It fucking can't be. It's a culmination of many problems. But what if there was one problem? What if there was one overarching problem that could be pointed to for everything that was wrong from the game's very foundations? I like to consider myself a very industrious and creative person, so I've created a new term. It's like autobiography, wherein someone writes their own biography, or autofellatio, wherein McGee makes a game and sucks his own dick throughout its entire runtime. Yes! I've created a new term that explains everything from the ground up to the top down that is wrong with this scrumptious little endeavor, and I call it autofanfiction. In American McGee's Alice, everything served a purpose. Everything meant something. Some things required reading the casebook to get a better understanding, but for the most part, the themes and points were made in the game. The Tweedles were orderlies who tormented Alice. The Hatter is how she saw her doctor. The Cat and Queen were parts of her, etc. The original game was a story of trauma, loss, and mental illness told through the lens of Alice in Wonderland. Madness Returns is anime protagonist killing a Saturday morning cartoon villain but just uses the characters of American McGee's Alice. It's fan fiction and it comes with all of those problems. Nobody is really representative of anything. The Hatter is just some half-mad muttering tinkerer, Dormouse and March Hare are just there, Cheshire is just sarcastic, and the list goes on. Every character that meant something has that meaning removed, bastardized, and repurposed to fit this new story, changed for convenience, rather than narrative with relevancy thrown to the wayside. Nowhere is this more apparent than with the Red Queen. Make no mistake, changing the Queen to be a representation of Alice's sister Lizzie can work and for the most part does a pretty decent job. What once was a dark and locked away portion of her psyche in survival at all costs mode has now been replaced by a stand-in of her older sister whom she looked up to. Lizzie would have held a place of reverence in Alice's mind in a sort of mentoring fashion, so making her the Queen who will chide her but give her the information she needs to continue can work. Except that's not really what she's here for? Okay, let me take a moment to clarify why exactly it doesn't work, since I feel what I've already got leaves something to be desired. Alice is not well. She knows this. Hatter tells her she needs to go see the Mock Turtle. Mock Turtle tells her she needs to go see the Carpenter. Carpenter then tells her that she's not just unwell, she's being made worse, that she needs to find out who is doing it, and to seek Caterpillar. Caterpillar tells her she needs to see the Queen, and that's about it, and the Queen tells her exactly what the carpenter told her. She's being made more unwell and she needs to figure out by whom. The purpose of her being a grudging mentor is completely shunted in favor of her just regurgitating what another character already told Alice. In the original game, each character served a strong purpose not just narratively, but in either aiding Alice in her journey or in acting with the queen. Here, characters are cardboard cutouts. What separates the queen from the carpenter is not a character, narrative, or functional difference, but is just telling her what she's already been told, but this time with an attitude. This isn't just a staple of fan fiction, it's really fucking bad writing. Bimbus raped and murdered Lizzie, then burned down the little house in an attempt to cover up the crime, and then got Alice transferred to his care in order to turn her into a mentally inept fuck doll to make sure nobody ever learned the truth. Then, this happens. I had a role in my family's demise, but I did not start the fire. I had a role in my family's demise. I had a role in my family's demise. I had a role in my family's demise. Yes, then he completely undermines Alice's journey in the first game. Everything the previous game was is completely thrown by the wayside, retconned, 
and bastardized to suit its new purpose with zero regard to the original work or intent. Just like fan fiction. It took me way too many playthroughs to really piece this together, but even by the halfway point of that first run, I knew something was cripplingly wrong. And there it is, in all its glory. EA didn't ruin this game. American McGee himself did. I don't care how many times EA dicked them on doling out funds. I don't care how they fucked them other... <clears throat> I don't care how they fucked them over through needless time crunches. None of that really matters because what did make it into the game, what was as intended, destroys everything that was good about the first. This game didn't fail because of EA. It failed because of American McGee. Let's be real about something. Every time I play this game, I fucking love what I see. I hate what I play, but what I see is just so goddamn good, it leaves a lasting impression on me that always makes me forget truly how fucking bad it plays. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's beautiful, inventive, and has blasted the test of time in Unreal Engine 3. And those facts alone make me forget every single time I play this game, that chapter three exists. I fucking hope you like gray. I've stated before that most of the game is absolutely beautiful, and yes, it is. Hatter's Domain presents the player with this phenomenal image of a hyper-industrial revolution with the hare and dormouse having taken over. A blasted good night. Hatter, I recall leaving you in a decrepit condition. What? Not in pieces. Uh. Really, bitch? Ah! Chapter 2 starts us off in the frozen north with allusions to the northern pass expeditions and moving down into Bikini Bottom and marking itself as my second favorite design. I am nothing if not a lover of the nautical and these big titty fishes and villages of wrecked ships just tickle the fuck out of my own imagination. Chapter 4 when we head into the decayed Queensland has plenty of love given to the original game and I am always excited to start it, not only having some of the best progression but the best level design, even if they do kind of rip off the Dehaka. <laughs> Final chapter, I can take or leave. Pine boxes and broken dollhouses is pretty good, but they never truly go anywhere with it and the soundtrack doesn't help anything. It's good, great in some parts even, but it's got lengthy, incredibly bland segments at the tail end of a game that has long overstayed its welcome. Hey, I skipped over chapter three. Yeah, I did that on purpose because every time I play this game, I have forgotten it fucking exists because it's fucking bad. Alice gets shrunk, even more shrunk than the drink we juice allows her to be in order to engage in the secret hunt slogging and must climb an anthill to reach the caterpillar. Just before that, she goes to see her lawyer, who is a massive fucking weeb. So this chapter is China being invaded by wasp samurai and it's gray. It has these hints of jades and blues, but it's 90% gray, gray, and more fucking gray. It's also an absolute trudge to play through because of its level design. Alice must scale the anthill and a massive portion of it is spent on slides or just being thrown back down, giving the player the sense that every bit of progress made is being quickly undone. You're spinning your wheels, pacing in circles, rolling a bowler up a hill just for it to roll over you and start over again. In a game that is incredibly bland, repetitive, and the level design is broken up only by absolute slogs and secret hunting, this shit is just fucking awful and actively makes the player feel like they're not making progress progress. And make no mistake, the game is far more linear than even the first game, and that's prevalent throughout. It just happens to have really good highlights. What isn't a highlight, however, is the prevalence of slides. Alice gets on a slide, and this would be the point where the game would show off these stunning vistas to the player and create a wonderful effect, but instead it's locked to facing down at Alice and hiding backgrounds that should be revealing new things to the player and our protagonist. And there's a fuckload of them, and they control like shit. World design is also pretty fucking bad. Chapters try to be a contiguous experience, but Alice is constantly teleporting along a path that is far more linear than its predecessor. In the previous title, you're only transported across massive distances like twice, and in both cases you're shown how it's done. But other than that, you see where you're going next, and you see where you came from. You are with Alice through every step of the journey. Along with the world design feeling truly alive, it creates an in-depth guided tour of the world that feels much larger than it actually is. Madness returns, piss poor linear platforming, constant teleports, and a world that doesn't feel like it exists for anything other than convenience, makes it more of a theme park ride, and not a fun one. 
It's also not helped by how the narrative is presented. In the original, from the get-go you see the Queen's corruption. You see how it has stretched and affected the village of the Fire Gnomes, even all the way out here, the furthest possible point from her keep, and her tentacles are strangling the land. As you get closer, her corruption thickens. From the word go, she is a part of the experience because what she is, is fucking important to the story. Madness returns, things show up when needed, and are gone the second they aren't delivering plot dumps anymore. Nothing and no one. The themes constantly change, the ideas constantly change, and this overarching threat Bumby should be presenting is replaced by a train that doesn't even show up until halfway through the fucking game. It's all plot convenience, only showing up when needed, leaving when it's not, and nothing in the game is built around any of that importance. A game that is somewhere over twice the length feels half as large. Combat is equally bad, and unless you explore the mechanics, you may miss out why. You see, if you press the Vorpal Blade attack three times, Alice swings three times. This is correct. This is how games work. But if you press it only two times, Alice still swings three times. The first Hobby Horse attack has quick recovery that can be dodge canceled. The second and third attack do not, locking you into committing to using them and spending a lot more time resulting in the player taking unavoidable damage as a result uh, for engaging with the tools in Alice's arsenal. But there are also some minor combos. You can end a Vorpal Blade string with a single horse attack. You can end a horse combo with a Vorpal Blade attack. It's not deep, but it breaks things up and they have utility. And we had far deeper combo systems in Prince of Persia half a decade earlier. Aside from the two melee weapons, Alice gains a gun and grenade launcher. These have combat potential aside from their constant use as puzzle solving tools. Puzzles, of course, being in massive quotation marks, mind you. In fact, you'll start to learn how to work ranged weapons into your combat and soon learn that just mashing Vorpal Blade and then pressing fire to launch a T-bomb and start the combo over without having to think at all, ever, is what the combat will devolve into. Dig, if you will, this picture. And that is, of course, when the game is actually letting you damage an enemy. Yeah, the combat is kind of fucking awful. The game almost requires a lock-on feature, as without it, you can't control the direction of Alice's attacks very easily. Where she faces is where she swings, so you have to point her in the direction you want her to swing before you press the attack button, which adds this extra level of sluggishness to it all. So to fix that, they added in the lock-on feature. This letterboxes your screen, kills your vision field, and completely fucks over the camera controls, resulting in you constantly taking unavoidable damage from things that are off screen that you can't even see and can't adjust the camera for. Imagine not being able to see Alice, because an enemy took one step to the left, so you can't even see yourself being hit from off screen by the thing that you couldn't see anyway. Fucking brilliant. What the fuck is playtesting? Anybody ever heard of it? The worst part of the game's combat isn't how it's an anachronism even in its time. It's not how years of Windows updates have been harsh on the game's performance. No, the worst part of the game is how fucking much of it is just hurry up and wait. Wait for the big ruins to throw the thing that you can deflect to make them damageable. Wait for the drowned sailor to produce bombs to blow up to make him vulnerable or to do an attack you can dodge that leaves him so. Wait for drifting ruin to make themselves vulnerable. Wait for the bitch babies to power up a charge attack or shoot at you. Wait for the armored guards to do an attack that you can dodge but leaves them open to damage. Wait. 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 FUCKING WAIT! All this game does is waste your fucking time. The incredibly lengthy segments are filled with side paths to hold the shrink button and slowly walk through keyholes to slowly walk back through, which granted you a memory that may or may not have been relevant to the story, or a single gold tooth granting you literally 1% of the teeth needed for your next upgrade. Or my fucking favorite, bottles. Bottles do nothing. They just fill out yet another anachronism, the collectathon checklist. And there it is. The one thing that became so popular around 2007 to nearly 2014, so popular that it had to be in every single goddamn game. That thing that every motherfucker on this planet fucking hates. Yes, this game has shitty QTEs. You can skip them, but they're still there. 
This game is painfully designed to take a five hour game and stretch your asshole out to seven more hours. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the sliding tile puzzles. I have no problems with these. Sure, a lot of people just aren't good at them, but I am, so they tend to not really slow me down. So that's why American decided you need to be shown the tiles disappearing, make you go find them before you can even attempt the puzzle, and my fucking favorite part comes in chapter two. I'm being forced to slog through this padding, and then the game starts fucking nagging me! I need the poster now. Quickly, it could be here any minute. Quick, before the show begins. Even the platforming sucks. Alice has multiple jumps, and these sections will generally devolve into stretching her multi-jump float ability as far as it can possibly get. The best part of bad platformer design shows up here as well. There's no ledge grab like in the previous game, or slight upward teleport for missing a jump by, a, say, a pixel or two. If you take a jump, and the only thing that doesn't clear the ledge is the very fucking tip of Alice's big toe, she falls into the void. That's it. Take some damage, do it again. Tight platforming is great when that is the purpose, but this is not a tight platformer, and you are constantly punished for not having surgical precision in your inputs in a game that fucking loves ignoring your inputs in the first place. Some secret hunting starts to require Alice to use her shrink sense to see invisible platforms, because that's fucking fun. Pad out the length of a bland segment by making me constantly press a button to make sure I know where I'm going to have to jump to. Fine. Whatever. It's just secrets, right? Nope! The game quickly starts adding the invisible platforms into the mainline progression, and now the shitty platforming game is made so much fucking better by forcing the player to constantly deal with invisible fucking platforms. And that brings us to today's sponsor, you going straight to hell. Seriously, fuck you. This game fucking hurts to play. There is no other way to put it, and by the end of chapter three, I'm ready to just be done. I get a bit of a second win from chapter four, but Five just makes me very tired, very fucking fast. Okay, like I know we're having plenty of fun here and we're just kind of shitting all over the place, but I have to ask a very serious question. Who the fuck is Jason Ty? This soundtrack is pure ass. None of it works. Alice had these heavily invested and delicately crafted atmospheric tracks, evoking the sadism and malice of untempered children, loss, tragic nostalgia, foreboding dread, tinged with wonder. Madness has violins, and not a single memorable track. I would say it's underdeveloped, but the reality is that it's probably exactly what they wanted it to be, and it's shit. Bland, empty, repetitive, and absolutely forgettable. And thank fuck that's the end of that. Did I mention padding? 
Yeah, let's go back to that. After chapter one, the game will feature some mini games, a really shitty shmup, a really shitty side scroller, and a really shitty chess game, and a really shitty marble platforming segment. These suck. Their physics suck, their designs suck, and they do nothing but pad out the runtime. Most of them you have to do multiple times. The shmup, you only actually have to do a second time if you want a piece of the health upgrade, but the platformer, worst chess puzzle and rolling game, you're forced to do multiple times, and they do not feel good to play. Yes, the health upgrades. These are obtained by completing Radula rooms. Yet more secrets to find, of course. They will take the form of a combat room you must complete, a combat room you must run around in circles, avoiding enemies until the timer runs out, another segment of the chapter's shit-tier gimmick segment, and my favorite, a multiple-choice children's riddle. Really putting those creative juices to work, aren't we? Is there anything else I can bitch about? No? Well, okay, aside from the stellar art direction excepting Chapter 3, of course, there is absolutely one thing I love about this game, and that's that eventually... it ends. I'll see you charged. In prison, some half-wit bruiser will make you his sweetheart, and then you'll hang. Indeed. A hysterical woman, former lunatic, roaring outrageous accusations against a respectable social architect and scientist. My god, Alice, who would believe you? I scarcely believe it myself. You, monstrous creature. Such evil will be punished. By whom? By what? Psychotic, silly bitch. Your madness will be punished. Now leave. I'm expecting your replacement. For all his bluster and all his scheming in the end, it was Alice who ran a train on him. Ironic. No, don't transition yet. I've got at least three more dead memes I can cram into this. Alice uncovers the... Mm. Truth. Bumby did it all. The Jabberwock was right and she had a part in her family's death and then she confronts and kills Bumby in meat space. Jesus ejaculating all over some fat ass titties, Christ. How the fuck can this get any worse? This is where it ends, and the wretchedness begins. It would be easy to lay all the blame at EA's feet. Lord knows they fucking deserve it. From cutting dates that X or Y needed to be done and withholding funds forcing them to make cuts and concessions all over. But just as the casebook is a great source of information on what happens in the first game, this wonderful little art book gives us a hell of a lot of information of just what the fuck is going on. Sure, thanks to EA, they had to drop the real-world segments in which would have platforming and the umbrella combat, but we also learned that multiple artists walked out when they learned that there was an art direction that was going to be followed, and that their vision wasn't going to be what was taking charge. That's bad management. It means when they were hired, they had an unrealistic vision of what was their role was going to be. So we can't lay the blame entirely at EA's desk. Even what went in as intended, presents massive fucking issues, and what came next presents even more. Look, I'm no stranger to merchandising. It's great advertising and gives supporters plenty of gamer tat to slowly build a shrine to their favorite game to put in the background of all their shit-tier YouTube videos. In fact, that little line of figures designed by motherfucking Todd McFarlane of Spawn Baseball and getting sued for using a hockey player's name, Fame, even gets a shout out in the game. This isn't just a random figure of the Hatter, it's a direct reference to the toy line. Hot diggity damn, but that's different than what came after our Madness Returns. After the release of Madness Returns, McGee put up a Kickstarter for a series he called Alice Otherlands. It was advertised as a series of shorts wherein Alice would explore the minds of real life figures such as Jules Verne and... 
Lee Harvey Oswald. I don't fucking know, none of it interested me because again, I don't give a flying fuck about this endless franchising of a property. Sometime later, American announced he was starting up a Patreon for a very specific purpose. You guessed it, Alice 3. Titled Alice Asylum, he seeks to fund the production of a proposal to send to EA to get the rights to make a third title in the series. Since then, some confirmation of talks to turn Alice into a TV show or Netflix show or some shit have entered the fray, and I think you can start to see where this is fucking going. American McGee's Alice was an experiment. It was a piece of art that took a great deal of care and meditation. But Alice? She's become a prop, a franchise, something McGee is avidly trying to prove to EA can be profitable, regardless of how much history has proven that's a bad idea. He wants to strip it of everything it was and pour it out to the lowest bidder. Does that sound like a life's work? Like a driven man making art? Or does it sound exactly like fucking Dr. Bumby was trying to do? No! I'm not excited for a third Alice title. He already retconned and fucked up the sequel. How could I think a third would be any different? Why would you think a third would be any different? It's not a third game coming after Madness Returns either. He wants to make a prequel. A prequel to a self-contained 20-year-old game whose sequel has already proven he can't do what he once did, whose pre-development is funded on Patreon, which is made up of an echo chamber of sycophantic fans who not only don't want to hear how bad of an idea it is, they don't want McGee to examine the reality of how bad of an idea it is. You couldn't raise a bigger red flag if you moved to China and started simping for the government. Ken Wong was a massive inspiration to me growing up. I still have his website, Passages for Lost Clouds, bookmarked, and I still go through it from time to time. Omri Koresh has a phenomenal mod for the original game up on ModDB, and this is what they choose to follow? A man trying to relive the glory days, crawling back to the people who spent more than the last decade fucking him over a barrel over and over? All to chase something that has long since been lost? I thought everyone involved was better than this. This? This ain't it, Chief, and neither is everything that's come out since. What the fuck is going on, American? Is this a midlife crisis? Do you look in the mirror every day and only see what was? You have children, so you can't be down this bad. This can't be what the last 20 fucking years of your life will amount to, trying to recapture long-lost glory days instead of trying to forge new ones. This isn't just stagnation, it's acknowledging it is, and choosing it regardless. You will bring down two phenomenal artists with you, and I think you need to listen to something other than Yes Men, because these are not the decisions of someone who does. Even if Asylum gets approved and the funding you need gets approved, it'll just play out the same way all over again. EA hasn't changed. That doesn't mean you need to be the same. You're better than that. Your entire team is better than that. Me? I'm the Necro Swanson, and you can go fuck yourselves. I promise this has a happy ending, and I even actually did more than allude to it throughout the video. But here we finally are, just as foretold. The greatest thing about this game is that no matter how brain dead I become by the end of it, no matter how much I have to spend on tequila to get through it, no matter how much I absolutely dread having to play it, and no matter how much I hate it when I fucking am, it always ends. And with this, a curse is lifted. For half a decade, Origin and its crash-happy version of this game have sat on my fucking hard drive. And now they can go away, never to darken my doorstep again. With this, I am free. Free to fucking party! Hit it!